My name is John Mitchell. I'd like to welcome you to the launch of a, hello, <laughs> a fascinating new book uh, by Hugo Slim called Humanitarian Ethics, A Guide to the Morality of Aid and War in Disaster. And I'd also like to welcome our online participants from around the world. You'll have a, an opportunity to pose questions and comments on the on, online chat room. So please don't be shy. We're very much looking forward to hearing from you later. In fact, I'd like to make this discussion as interactive as possible, so I'll make sure that there's a, a good amount of time at the end for a full discussion. Now, before I get on to the introductions, just a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, books are for sale in the foyer. Now, Hugo, I believe, has been signing them at registration already, uh, but will continue to do so at the drinks reception after this event. And, of course, you're all very welcome to join us for a drink afterwards. And we will be live tweeting this event using the hashtag, which you can see just up there. Um, the Wi-Fi key is there too, so you can connect to our network. So I do encourage you to tweet. Um, I'm sure you're going to hear some very tweetable things <laughs> over the next 90 minutes, so please go ahead and do that. Um, so let me begin by introducing you to Hugo, the author of the book and the panel. So Hugo, on my right here, many of you will know, I'm sure, uh, he's a leading scholar in humanitarian studies with particular expertise in humanitarian ethics, the protection of civilians, conflict resolution and business ethics. Uh, Hugo was the ELAC Associate Director and Senior Research Fellow in the Department of Politics and international relations at the University of Oxford. And he also established the Oxford Humanitarian Group within ELAC, which I believe is a new interdisciplinary discussion group for humanitarian studies that brings together the University of Oxford, Oxford Brookes University, and Oxfam. And as you probably know, Hugo is now currently head of policy at the ICRC. Um, and before Hugo talks about the book, I also want to introduce you to two special guests we have, uh, both, of us who, uh, both of whom are going to help us with the discussion. Uh, they have a particular skill set and experience which I think is particularly relevant to this topic. And on my right at the end there is, is Alice Obrecht, Dr. Alice Obrecht, and Alice is leading ALNAP's work on effectiveness and innovation. And she's currently representing ALNAP on the Effectiveness Thematic Team for the World Humanitarian Summit. And she was the lead author of the WHS thematic paper on accountability last year. And prior to uh, joining ALNAP, uh, Alice has written and worked on the topic of NGO ethics and accountability. And on my left, we have uh, Rianne uh, ten Vine, is, is that Vin. correct? Vin. Vin. Say that again? Ten Vine. Ten Vine, okay, thank you very much. And Rianne is, is head of uh, research at Osman Consulting, and she has 10 years humanitarian experience with Islamic relief worldwide. She's also an associate lecturer at the Open University, teaching on environment, ethics, and international law. She also takes a module called Islam in the West, the Politics of Coexistence, and is interested in comparing the humanitarian aid principle of do no harm with the Islamic principle of la dara, la dara. La dara. Which good. literally means the same thing. Literally means the same thing. Perfect. All right, good. Um, now, Hugo has pointed out to me that, that his book has been written from a Judeo-Christian perspective, and that's why we have these two panellists here, because I think, Rianne, you'll be able to give us a perspective from an Islamic perspective. Uh, uh, viewpoint. And Alice, of course, is a, a student of John Stuart Mill and, and others, and she will be give us, giving us a perspective from uh, a uh, humanist, um, secular, yeah. <laughs> pagan, not pagan, I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> uh, but a utilitarian perspective. So it's a, it's a real uh, pleasure to have uh, them all with us to, uh, this afternoon. So can you give me, uh, join me with a round of applause and welcome to the panel. Great. So just a few words from me, just to say that it's a real pleasure to, to launch uh, Hugo's latest book, which I very much enjoyed reading, and as always, appreciated its clarity and lucid style. 
And I know that a lot of very good written material is, um, comes out every year in a humanitarian world, but it's also true, I think, that a lot of it is rather formulaic. And so it's nice to read something which has a signature style. And, you know, after I'd finished reading the book, uh, I found myself reflecting on some of the other books that have been written by humanitarians ab about uh, very difficult situations that they face in the field. And I'm reminded of Tony Vokes's book, The Selfish Altruist, which was uh, uh, really um, describes the difficulties of being trying to be altruistic in very difficult crisis situations. And more recently, I, I read at least half of uh, Mukesh Kapila's book, Against the Tide of Evil, uh, which describes his experiences in, in the Sudan and uh, the genocide in Darfur. And in this book, some of you may have looked at it right and wrong, uh, uh, and painted in more of a black and white way, I would say. But both of these books are very much about moral dilemmas and about doing the right thing. And it struck me at the end of Hugo's book that... Um, both Tony and Mukesh would have benefited, I think, from reading this um, as it presents us with uh, many good examples of the rights and wrongs of morally challenging situations. So the book has great practical value, I think. A bit late for Tony and Mukesh, but uh, essential reading for successive generations of humanitarians. So, without further ado, let's turn to Hugo who's going to tell us what's in it. And I believe is, we're very, very honoured. You're going to read us a little bit from it as well, aren't you? To fill time. To fill time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so John, thank, thank you, you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you um, for having this launch at Alnap. It's, it's um, lovely for me to do that, partly because I first worked with you in 1985, but also because Alnap is such an important organisation for us now in the humanitarian sector, I think, and um, you, you achieve a lot. So I'm... Delighted we're doing it at Alnap. Thank you. And thank you to both my panellists, the godless Alice and the godful Rianne. That's fantastic. I feel surrounded with all the different kinds of things we need in a liberal society, so that's great. Um, and thank you for coming. It's very kind of you to come, and those of you on the web as well. That's great. It's particularly nice for me, too, because as a surprise to me, there are a couple of people I worked with years ago in Save the Children. Annie, who I worked with in Wad Cowley in 1985 years ago, and Carolyn as well at Save the Children years ago. So it's lovely for me to, um, to see them here as well. And I want to thank the NGOs who helped fund this project. Although we did it at Oxford, it was um, inevitably paid for by, and I think rightly paid for, by others who wanted to bring something together on ethics. So to thank Oxfam, Save the Children, World Vision, CAFOD, Islamic Relief, World Jewish Relief um, for, for their help. And of course, British Red Cross and Sorsha is here, who really was the person who, who got it going for us. Um, and Hearst, the publishers, who have been wonderful as always. It's wonderful working with a small independent press because they are everything a big organization usually isn't. They're decisive, quick, <laughs> etc. So it's been a joy to work with them. Now, why I wrote the book. Um, why I wrote the book, I think I, I became an academic after about 10 years of working in the field. And as Annie just reminded me, I said to her, surely I was quite a good aid worker, wasn't I? And she said, no, you were always very academic, Hugo. So, so I became a proper academic in, in 1994 when humanitarian work was really taking off in the world. And it was considered a, a huge profession suddenly. And there was a lot more money going into it. And it was more politically significant. And I worked with Nabil Hamdi at Oxford Brookes University to start a course for um, humanitarian workers. And in a way, to design the education I should have had, but never had before I started. And when I became an academic, I thought, well, what do I do? I've got, you know, I've got a degree in theology. And um, you know, I've worked a bit in the field. So how do I make a contribution? And at that time, there were brilliant people like Alex Duval and Mike Duffield and David Keane and Joe McRae and all sorts of people writing like crazy in a very serious, brilliant, political sort of economy, political science way. And I thought, well, I can't really do that because they all had PhDs and things. So I began to realize that there was a place to go back in our profession to our values and to our ethics. And that coincided a little bit with what I'd learned at university as a theologian and probably with my temperament. And so I began to think, well, maybe we should write about the ethics of what we do. So I did that for a bit. Um, and then when I came back to academia after doing various other things a few years ago, I had a chat with John. And he said, Hugo, you know your article on doing the right thing? It's still one of the 
four most read articles every year from disasters. I think you should probably write a book about it. So I did. So thank you for mind making me do it. So that's really why I wrote it, to try and put down, in a sense, what, what I feel is important about our profession. And having taught a lot of people, I was very aware that people want a strong sense of why they are doing this and why it's important. So I thought I'd try and remind us about that in some way. So what's in the book? Um, really, it's an introduction to how I see the field at the moment, the challenges of being a humanitarian worker, some of our core um, problems as a, as, a, as a field of practice. I also tried to write an opening chapter which talked about where we, particularly in the West and in the secular West, get our moral values from. So I explored our ancient philosophers like Aristotle and our more Enlightenment philosophers, who are usually Scottish, of course, although we say they're British. Um, people like David Hume, wonderful people like that, and then Germans like Kant. And I looked at where we understand the ethic of helping others from, and notions of sympathy and empathy and philosophy. And then in the first half of the book, really, I tried to do what I call very modestly a new commentary on our humanitarian principles. So I look for a little at humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence, and think about those and give a little commentary on those. And then I also look at the other six in the Code of Conduct, because I rather respect the Code of Conduct as a document. I think it's 20 years old. I think it's quite a good document. So I look at those, and I look at what I understand as the dignity principles around participation and empowerment and capacity building, the fact that we, we live a more dignified life if we help to make our own life and make our own communities. And that's why participation, capacity building are ethical. And we should want to involve people always in their own survival and recovery and in the way we work with them. So the dignity principles. And then I looked also at stewardship and accountability principles around sustainability, which are in the code, and accountability on which Alice is something of an expert in, in various ways. Um, and then, having done that, in the second half of the book, I wanted to think about how we do ethics. So I wanted to think a little about how we use our head, our heart, and our emotions, and our actions. And I suppose I encourage all humanitarian workers in an approach which is at once emotional and reasonable in the best sense. Because I do feel that ethics can um, become misrepresented as a sort of calculative intellectual exercise, usually done by men who can say, oh, we can work this out. We, there must be an equation. <laughs> but of course, one of the great things about ethics in the last 10, 20 years is a lot of women have come into the, the field and said, look, guys, you're not going to figure it out. It's not a cerebral thing. It's as much about how you feel about what is happening around you. And emotions are ethical. And we should use them as prompts in that way. So I try and encourage us to do that. Um, and then I look really at how we deliberate, or how we could deliberate, which is an ethical term for really discussing things seriously as humanitarian agencies. And then I look at moral responsibility and the types of moral choices we tend to face um, as we do so. And then at the end, I have a chapter where I try and categorize as many of the typical moral problems we tend to face um, as we work. And there are classic problems like making things worse, you know, the sort of consequentialist nightmare of indirect effect that make things worse for people rather than better. Um, complicity. Are we becoming complicit with the sinister objectives of other parties when we work close to them? All these things I try to look at with some examples and help us to think through. And then at the end, I um, have a chapter where I try and think about us as individual human beings and individual humanitarian workers and the kind of virtues we need. And I consider humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence as our humanitarian virtues. But I also consider we need everyday virtues that every religious, secular tradition <laughs> also values, like courage, patience, integrity, hope, and struggle. And so that's what I tried to do in this book. And I hope it's useful. It's really 
for, um, I mean, you write the book you write, but I really always had in mind the people I used to teach in the classroom, people already humanitarian workers, people wanting to be humanitarian workers. I had in mind reflective, interested humanitarian workers all over the world who might want to read it at night in a difficult situation and gradually work through it. And I hope it makes a contribution. And as John said, I'm going to just read a few bits of it. Because I was with a very glamorous woman from Florida the other day, for utterly ethical reasons. I mean. <laughs> and, and she said, oh, you're doing a book launch? And I said, well, I am. And she said, are you going to read from your book? And I thought, oh, I've never thought of reading from my book. But of course, if you're a novelist or something, they always read from their book and look terribly important and read you know, moving passages. So I thought I would read. Um, so the first bit I'm going to read is um, a little bit about the principle of humanity. Because I thought the first thing I had to do in this book was really understand why we think human life is a good thing and why we want to save it. And so I tried to think about that a little. So I'm just going to read you um, a couple of paragraphs in that vein. And this means a glasses change. It could make me look intelligent. It could just make me look old. But there we go. Here we go. So here's a couple of paragraphs about humanity and the goal of humanitarian action. The goal of humanitarian ethics is, therefore, very immediate and intimate. It is pressing rather than prospective. When human life is threatened amidst violence and disaster, the person is the humanitarian goal, rather than some grand vision of political society. Humanitarian action is a teleology of person, not politics. There is no greater goal beyond the person in humanitarian action, not peace, not democracy, not religious conversion, not socialism, not political Islam, and not military victory. Humanitarian action is an urgent and limited ethics of protection and assistance in extremis. It may have interests in peace and the wider political, economic, social flourishing of human beings, but these interests function more like hopes than goals. In the same way that a boat, if it could hope, might hope for good weather rather than bad, so humanitarians hope for peace and good government but the actual goal of their work is to protect the human person and to protect human life. But what is a human life, and why is it good? How should we understand this basic good that commands our most fundamental morality and requires humanitarian action? Life is all we have as human beings. It is because of life, its pulsing, breathing consciousness, that we know joy and pain, others and ourselves. With life, we exist and face outwards to create meaning, relationships, and love. Most importantly, human life is a unity of body and mind. There is no dualism between the life of the body and the life of the mind. Instead, human life is to be understand by, understood biographically as personhood and individuality, as well as biologically as flesh and blood. Our person is nothing without our body, and our body is nothing without our person. We live embodied. Our life is body, mind, and feeling lived in a single experience as a human person. <coughs> a human life is always a person, not just a body. Living is being somebody, and <coughs> uniquely someone. The term humanity rather than human life is the first principle of humanitarian action, precisely because humanitarians have always wanted to capture this personal depth to, hum to human life, and to talk of persons, not bodies. So that's how I tried to think about what we mean by humanity and why we think it is so important to save other people. And the answer, of course, really, is because we know how important our life is to us, each of us ourselves. So because we value our own lives, we can see how precious it is in others. The next bit I'm going to read is a little section from the Persistent Ethical Problems chapter. <coughs> because one of the, the big problems in humanitarian aid very often is that people have been very critical of us because we end up in difficult spaces helping people while other people are also doing horrible things like trying to kill them, displace them, destitute them, um, exclude them from their politics, etc. And it often looks, because we're close, that somehow we're involved in all that. Um, so I want to read a little about the problem of what I call, thanks to my colleague David Roden at Oxford, moral entrapment. 
Because I think, more usually, we're in a trap rather than in some active complicity or negligence. <coughs> so I, I wrote, it may also be fairer to nuance the wider notion of complicity with one of entrapment. Most agencies that decide to stay in these difficult situations are morally entrapped rather than simply complicit and morally irresponsible. In such circumstances, it seems fair to suggest that they are acting rightly for someone who is entrapped. The moral philosopher David Rodin has elaborated the notion of moral entrapment in his discussion of just war theory. As Rodin observes, a trap is something that is easy to get into and hard to get out of. Rodin's thinking can be usefully applied to humanitarian entrapment too. Most humanitarian endeavors, whether in politics, business, marriage, or medicine, are characterized by one persistent variable, that things will change once you start upon a venture. Some of these changes will be enabling, others will not. The Prussian general Helmut von Moltke coined the famous military adage that a battle plan never survives first contact with the enemy. And the same is true in humanitarian work. Various things can happen that begin to construct a moral trap. Other parties in a conflict or disaster have their own plans and will often want to block humanitarian action or exploit it somehow as part of their plan. Traps are often what Rodin calls dangling or aggravation dilemmas. He defines an aggravation dilemma as a paradoxical situation which you are left morally dangling. In an aggravation dilemma, the only way to avoid aggravating an offence is to continue to prosecute it. Rodin notes that most aggravation dilemmas are associated with exit decisions of some kind. Very often there will be issues of extrication from immorality that will require wrongdoers to continue the immoral action prior to its termination. I'm not suggesting that agencies are acting immorally in these situations, but Rodin's specification of this predicament is useful. The party left dangling in a potentially immoral situation seeks an exit from it. But the best way to achieve that exit is, paradoxically, to keep, what they are, to keep doing what they are doing until rescue of some kind arrives or a better solution emerges. This seems to fit the bill for many humanitarian predicaments. It's another reason why agencies are usually right to stay until international action, new aid strategies, or a change in the warring party's unethical policy transforms the situation. So that's a taste of the discussion of persistent moral problems of which entrapment or complicity or whatever is, is a very common one. And as you'll see, I tend to be more sympathetic to people who decide to try and stay, because often they are achieving good things in a difficult situation. And they're very seldom truly responsible for the worst things. And now the final thing, I want to just read a little section from right at the end of the book about those everyday virtues that people like you have. And people, many humanitarian workers that I've met, um, whether they're Sri Lankan or Somali or Sudanese or Syrian today, um, everywhere in the world, exhibit these extraordinary virtues. And we must cultivate them in ourselves and in our teams. So I'm going to read you little sections on integrity, hope, and struggle, and then I'll stop there. Integrity. Every humanitarian worker needs to be honest about what they stand for and the goals they seek. Working with humanitarian integrity means practicing humanitarian principles and extending a simple humanitarian intent to everyone you meet. Having humanitarian integrity involves doing things according to a humanitarian goal and with humanitarian principles. Alongside your actions, humanitarian integrity requires a certain humane presence and the cultivation of a humanitarian temperament that people recognize and trust. This is integrity of mission and purpose. Integrity is equally about honesty and trustworthiness in personal dealings, finances, recruitment, and resources management. And there is hope as well, another virtue. In the suffering of armed conflict and disaster, humanitarian workers can see the very worst of the world. To endure such things and respond positively to them not only takes courage, but hope. A famous Greek myth tells the story of Pandora, who was given a beautiful box by the gods and told never to open it. Naturally, she could not resist and had a peep inside. Out of the box flew all the evils of the world, which went on to create havoc and misery in human lives. But at the very bottom of the box 
was hope. This also flew out and took its place in human hearts. In the worst of times, hope is often all we have with which to struggle against the terrible things around us. Humanitarians need to cherish hope. Often they will discover it in the people they are trying to help. Often it will be best found in small instances of humanitarian success, like a life saved, a new life born, a successful distribution, or the eventual sound of laughter after incredible fear. Humanitarian action is itself an act of hope. It resolutely continues to express the value of human life, the existence of human kindness, and the conviction that we are a loving species. Humanitarians need to be hopeful for themselves and for others. Being hopeful does not mean being absurdly optimistic. It simply means knowing that the world does not turn on bad things alone, but also on good. Hope then seeks out this good and struggle. Few things come, more, come easily in humanitarian work. Instead, most humanitarian operations require significant struggle. Difficulty of all kinds is the <coughs> reality of humanitarian action for those who need it and those who provide it. Struggle is therefore inherent and essential to good humanitarian work. The ability to struggle and keep struggling is a critical virtue in humanitarian workers. The everyday virtues of courage, patience, practical wisdom, diligence, integrity, and hope are what enables individuals and organizations to struggle. But to continue to struggle and to struggle for the right things is a distinct virtue and an enduring strength in humanitarian work. So those are the sort of everyday virtues that I've seen in many, many people, and I see them in operations all around the world today, and I think are very important for us to cherish and value as our personal ethics. So that's really a taste of the book. Thank you. Hugo, thank you very much for that. Uh, much food for thought, and indeed, um, very moving uh, in parts that you, you're reading. So I think the message to the attractive lady in Florida is she was right. It was a, it was a good idea. Um, now, I wonder whether we should go right to a secular response or left to a, a, a religious response. I'm not going to focus on religious only. You're not? Okay. So, like, half-half. Well, why don't, we, why don't we start with you, Ian? Sure, Please, sure, go. sure. Because um, I look religious and I've <laughs> um, got some religious views, but uh, I did grow up secular, so in that sense I can see both sides and don't think that because I look religious and like the religious perspective that I therefore proselytize that you can only have ethics if you are my way. Um, in that sense, you know, that would be antithetic to the whole idea of religious teachings in the sense of, uh, you know, then I'm not walking my talk. I'm more behaving like a football hool hooligan, like my team is better than yours. Um, so in that sense, I think I can have both. Um, I very much enjoyed reading Hugo's uh, book. I thought it was very thought-provoking and very relevant and helpful for aid workers in the field in how to sometimes put things in perspective when you're faced with the daily challenges and, and see how maybe uh, situations elsewhere also um, raise similar challenges uh, that you have. But I think also for those who are not on the ground, and, and, and I think what Hugo also mentioned that, you know, why as aid workers we sometimes get all the blame, is I think people who aren't on the ground reading this book could really see, it's like actually it's not as easy as you think it is, and just physically being in a similar space doesn't mean that you actually also um, are complicit or, or, or agree with whatever is happening. Um, I think because I've only got a few minutes and really looking forward to the discussion, I thought I'd just put a few food for thought mm -hmm. ingredients out there to trigger some discussion. Um, firstly, obviously, humanitarian ethics, who's ethics. Hugo very much mentioned that he's about uh, uh, the Judeo-Christian side, but as Alice will say, is that, and I said I've got the secular background, doesn't have to be just the Judeo-Christian uh, one. Um, upon converting to Islam and then becoming an aid worker, I think IHL and humanitarian ethics are a copy-paste of Islamic teachings. Uh, not that you think so if you read the red taps and, 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 and other newspapers, but for those who do a bit of homework, um, I think would agree and happy to explain uh, later on. 
including issues around rights-based approach uh, for those uh, requiring aid. Um, but in that sense, around you know humanitarian ethics, whose ethics? Um, should we actually need a conclusion of, okay, let's go with Hugo's version, or let's go with Tom's version, or, or anything? Or should we actually say, no, part of the fun and part of the reality is that it is a complex issue, and it's part of its ability to adapt, so that when you respond to a situation in Somalia, a situation in Syria, a situation in Ukraine, you can still adapt it, because it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and then analyzing it in a bit more detail, I think it's about personal versus organizational ethics. Um, you know, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we'll have certain values, certain ethics, and subject to where you put yourself on scale of different things, is you will feel more attracted to join an organization like the ICRC or MSF or any organization in the middle. So obviously, in that sense, you would try to, as an aid worker, align uh, your employer with your personal ethics so you have less moral issues in the sense of, you know, I'm really of this school of thought, but my employer is asking me to do something completely against that. So as a personal issue, you have that opportunity to do that. Um, also, as an organization, some organizations won't really want to position themselves clearly. You know, the MSF is very clear on one end, ICRC on the other end, most somewhere in the middle, but don't want to put themselves in, in, in a particular box, and probably for good reason, because it allows them to be flexible. Um, and that refers to what Hugo mentioned about levels of agency. You know, as an individual, if you've decided to join Organization X, you give up some of that uh, agency. I think another... Um, uh, issue is around theory versus practice. You know, we can sit here nicely, safely in London and philosophize about what would be the best course of action in situation X, Y, or Z, but actually imagine being an aid worker and being faced with a particular situation. You can't say, okay, can you please wait, can I phone a friend and uh, ask what you should do in that situation? You have to respond in that situation. Um, so you can set out saying, look, these are some of my red lines, but you won't be able to have thought through all of them and faced uh, with them. So the practice thing, and then it's then back to also the personal versus organizational, is your organization may say, this is where we position ourselves, but if in a concrete situation on the ground you've done differently because you were faced with completely impossible options, you know, how does your um, organization respond? Do they paralyze you and say, oh, you shouldn't have done this? Or say, look, and coming then to the third aspect around norm versus exception in the sense of, you know, MSF or ICRC stand here, but, you know, John in the field may in a particular situation have done differently from what the official organization stands for. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden the organizational ethics have moved. It just means that, you know, John has made this, this decision um, because faced with that. Sometimes if so many people on the ground end up doing it, it can maybe move the organizational ethics in, in some respect. But generally speaking, you know, you'd have the, 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 the norm as to where an organization puts itself, and maybe some exception uh, in that sense. Um, I thought some of the dilemmas that I've personally been involved in, one is about the date of calling a famine. Famine is very much a slow onset disaster, very much man-made. You know, we didn't wake up and there, there it was. So as a wider society, you should say, shouldn't we as a wider society have ethics and say, look, if the harvest is going wrong one year, if the harvest is going wrong the next year, shouldn't we then respond? Shouldn't we, is it not morally wrong to wait till we've got the blown bellies on the, uh, on the TV screen and then blame the aid agencies for having done too little too late? You know, uh, whose ethics are we then uh, looking at? I very much was a desk officer at that time looking at the Horn of Africa and the, 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 the team on the field was, look, people are dying left, right and center. Please, can you give us some money? And like, yeah, but we haven't allocated money yet because the campaign hasn't been launched. And yes, we appreciate that we'd like to launch the campaign today, but if, if we can't use the word famine because we haven't got the specific stat on 
so many deaths, then it won't generate the money. So do we sacrifice Um, um Ali today for the greater good in, in that sense? Um, because I've only got one minute, just throwing in around um, reducing ethics to formula, actually in the negotiating uh, is actually making it worse because it suggests putting people in it to left formula. What it is, is putting a value on life and the formula is 250K USD and 175 times uh, per capita income. The cons it sounds like a mathematical formula, but the consequence is is that a 25-year-old sub-Saharan African is only worth 27K at, at death and a 25-year-old American almost 2 million USD. Uh, so if we, as aid workers, use stats around you know value for money in rescuing here or there. And the last one, uh, Hugo mentioned very much about the ethics of struggle. In Islamic teachings, we call that jihad. And again, you know, the proper jihad, not the one that BNP uses to against Islam or some crazy people uh, using, but have that. Thank you. Miriam, thank you very much for that interesting perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alice, over to you, please. Yes. The godless view, thank you. Um, I won't uh, heap more accolades on an already very praiseworthy and highly praised book, only to say the downside of such a rich book is that it's very difficult to consolidate your, your points into um, a concise seven minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, so I wanted to focus my points on three issues. First is the relationship and relative importance of intentions versus consequences, because that comes up in your book, in, as, as John was saying, in a very novel way. Um, second, to go back to this question you raise in one of the chapters of the book on what kind of ethics is a humanitarian ethics. Um, and then finally, to conclude with just a couple points on what a secular-based approach to humanitarian ethics might emphasize, although it's not necessarily restricted to a secular approach. So to start with intentions and consequences, I think um, as you probably know better than I do, intentions have had a pretty bad rap in humanitarian action over the past few decades. In fact, there was even a book called, I think, The Path to Hell, which implies, or The Road to Hell, which implies the negative impacts of good intentions and humanitarian assistance. And I think what's interesting about your book is that I was detecting a bit of a course correction there against the tirades against intentions, so that you were creating a safer and more supportive space for intention and the more relevance of intention in assessing the value of humanitarian action. And you were also creating a bit more of a skeptical space for consequences and looking at consequences as determining the moral value of, of a humanitarian action. So I just wanted to put that to the audience and to you to explore a bit more in terms of what the appropriate balance and dynamic between intention and consequence should be. So the way I understand simplistically the argument is that if we tend to focus too much on intentions as determining the moral value of a humanitarian decision, we risk losing sight of the consequences. And at worst case scenario, the consequences of humanitarian action are to cause harm. In the best case scenario, uh, if it goes wrong, the consequences of, of bad humanitarian action is to waste resources, is to not be effective, right? Um, if we look at more of a consequence-based approach, the risk there then is that we lose sight of the diverse range of moral values that you've pointed out that humanitarian actors need to weigh when, in their decision making. So I was thinking about what does it mean to try and think about the role of intentions in assessing the value of the moral value of humanitarian action. What kinds of intentions are we talking about here? One way to think about good intentions is to think about the idea that I intended well. I intended for good consequences to occur. So I meant well, right? That's one way we can understand good intentions. A second way we can understand good intentions, in which I've seen quite a lot in the work on humanitarian innovation, is a very specific type of intention. And this is the intention to uh, not use people as a means to an end in your action. And so in humanitarian innovation, one of the key ethical challenges and critiques that keeps coming up again and again is are humanitarian organizations, when they trial innovations in the field, are they using affected people as a means to an end? Are they experimenting with affected people? So that seems to be a rather important intention that has moral validity in, in how we assess uh, humanitarian deliberation and decision making. But beyond that intention, so the prohibition against intending to use people as a means to an end, I actually don't see 
what other moral value or moral relevance intentions might have. I think actually when we think about intentions in humanitarian action vis-a-vis -vis consequences, we really just mean that Kantian notion of avoiding the use of, of other people as a means to an end. And if we think about it in that way, then really what we're left with with humanitarian ethics in a simplistic kind of sense is a broadly consequentialist enterprise still. So if you take, for example, to go back to the principle of humanity, which I'm glad you read that section of your book because I think it's the best explication of why we should value um, humanity and what the principle of humanity means uh, that I've ever read, certainly. And I think you're, you're reading a section there that's trying to explain to us why humanity is valuable, why the principle of humanity um, is, is meaningful to us. But I think if we go to the question of how do we uphold the principle of humanity, how do we actually execute it, one way to read that execution is to think of the principle of humanity as calling for the maximal reduction of the greatest suffering of the greatest number of people, right, very million, but with the caveat that in doing that maxima maximization, we treat human life as an end in itself and not a means. And so if we have that caveat, that Kantian caveat, is that covering all of the things that we care about when we think about the moral relevance of intention, or have I missed something? So that's one question. Um, for you to consider. Point two about what kind of ethics is humanitarian ethics, and this will tie back into the consequentialist point. So you make a, a, a point in the book, which I think is really important, about how humanitarian ethics is a role morality. So role moralities are, are part of um, professional ethics. To say that you have a, a role morality-based obligation means that you have an obligation vis-a-vis -vis your role or your function. So the classic or paradigm case of a role morality is medical ethics. If you are a doctor, you have a certain set of obligations that you have to perform when you're performing the function of a doctor. You can have role morality for parents, for tradesmen, for all sorts of professions, for business ethics. And you talk about the role morality of a humanitarian ethics. But I think there's an important and interesting disanalogy between humanitarian ethics as a role morality and other forms of professional ethics or role morality ethics. Um, and this is that we don't believe that everyone in this room or everyone in the world has a moral obligation to become a doctor or to participate in medical services or provide medical services. So professional ethics and role moralities have the similar structure of an if-then statement. If you are a doctor, then you have these obligations. There is no higher level ethical claim about the moral value or importance or an obligation to become a doctor. But I think humanitarian ethics is different because you point out that humanitarian ethics as a role morality is guided by the humanitarian principles, but aren't those principles also universally applicable? And so my question then is, what is the nature of the principle of humanity for all citizens in the world? Is it a stringent obligation that we all have? So do we all owe people who are suffering in the crisis in Syria or the recent victims of the earthquake in Pakistan and Afghanistan, do we have a strong obligation to provide them with humanitarian assistance as individual citizens, non-humanitarian aid workers? Are we doing something wrong by not providing them with that assistance? So by not donating our funds or, or engaging in political action? And I think this kind of point can be summarized by, or, or neatly uh, put by asking, is humanitarian ethics an ethics of charity, or is it an ethics of justice? OK, I'll try, try my best. Is it a, an ethics of charity or an ethics of justice? I think many religious traditions approach the um, obligation to alleviate poverty and to reduce suffering as a charity of eth as an ethics of charity might be wrong though on the Islamic one, I see a shaking of the head. That's good. So the secularists and the Islamic can agree. Um, but I think that there's very strong secular arguments that have been made in development aid and can also be made in humanitarian aid for seeing this obligation as a stringent duty of, of justice. And the implications of that for role morality are that humanitarian organizations might actually have less ethical discretion over how they spend their money and what they choose to do if it's actually an obligation of justice and if we really take rights of affected people seriously. And then finally, just to conclude in, in one minute or less, um, I think reading the book, I really got the sense of an opportunity and a gap and a need for a more 
clearly secular um, argument or articulation of humanitarian ethics, so I thought it was really interesting to read it from that perspective. And just kind of two points here to conclude as a, as a woman to argue against emotion or against uh, the, the prior, the kind of equal or priority role given to emotion in, in ethical deliberation. I think emotion is really important for reflecting the richness of our moral lives, but we can't confuse what feels right with what is right. And that's where a reason-based approach to ethics is really critical, especially for humanitarian ethics, where people are making ethical decisions in high stressful, highly stressful situations where emotions tend to run high. I think actually what might be more useful is a, a set of reasoned rules and principles to which they can refer to. So that's my, my plea for, for rule and reason-based ethics. And thank you for providing us with so much to talk about. Thank you. Alice, thank you very much for that very probing and uh, analytical um, uh, stance and some very, very good questions for Hugo and everybody. Um, I just wanted to pick up one which um, is, is coming through um, the chat room. Uh, which picks up on your point about what kind of ethics. Uh, so we have a uh, question from Lucio Melandri from UNICEF. He says, can ethics based on Western vision and philosophical ground be interpreted as universal humanitarian ethics, mm -hmm. uh, which needs to be adopted by everyone? Um, so Hugo, there's three, three, three strands coming your way. The intentional v. consequentialist issue, what kind of ethics, and the secular question at the end there that Alice uh, put to you. Let's go to uh, you now. Uh, questions, clarifications, comments on anything that you've heard, and please um, do say who you are and uh, who, you, who you work for or who you're representing. And if you could keep your comments reasonably concise, I'd be very, very grateful because I think there's a lot of questions coming through. So, sir, please, we'll start with you. Thank you. 